Hello and welcome back to Infinite Space. We'll be continuing where we left off, which, if you recall, is after we met the the knight that we we're assigned to, and um, he appears to not be very happy about that. Uh, the protagonist was like, "Oh yeah, wow! I get to have like this prestigious knight be my like um my I guess mentor." I get to be his cadet, or what was it, his squire. Um, but as they were going along, it kind of looked like the knight was just sort of like, ugh, why do I have to do this again? Um, so yeah, eventually they managed to get home, and you could really tell that the, uh, that the knight was really uncomfortable with the situation. Um... The, the squire is supposed to be doing a lot of stuff for him, but um, he doesn't seem to be all up for that. But yeah, I guess we're going to get to see how this sort of develops. If he will continue to be sort of uncomfortable with the squire's presence, or if he will eventually warm up to him. Anywho, but yeah, so I guess without further ado, let us continue in finite space. It starts as it always does, with the rumble above the clouds, roiling, gray, angry, and menacing. The unending flashes of green are akin to lightning, though the sounds are far more terrifying. The green storm. The plague is attacking. The discharge from their ships turns clouds to a sickly green. A storm forms above. It is horrifying. I am scared, so scared. The silence is palpable, all faces upturned with fear and terror, waiting, hoping that this will pass if only no one speaks. A baby cries, a singular anguish cry. All hell breaks loose. Screams echo throughout the town, people run, it becomes a full-blown panic. I am amidst the sea of legs, clutching tight to mother's hand. She's leading me away, telling me to hurry. But I'm slow, confused. I lose her hand. So simply in that moment, so easily, she's gone. I'm alone in the crowd. I cry, adding my voice to the chorus around me. I spin as I try to find her, or catch a glimpse of her kind eyes. I hear her calling me, even though the wall of other noises. I hear her calling my name. Corwin! Corwin! Where are you, baby? Corwin! And pushed aside into an alley, people thunder past, the green flashing and booms of explosions overhead punctuate every heartbeat. Corwin! Has anyone seen my child? Then it happens. The first jet black spear rips through the cloud line. A plague ship hurls down towards the town. Screams intensify. Corwin! Cor- I surge upright in my bed, pulling harshly lungfuls of air into my heaving chest. I'm drenched in sweat. I throw myself out of bed and then stagger to the basin. The water spirals in a whirlpool down the drain as I splash my face repeatedly, drinking some handfuls shakily once finished. I look into the mirror over the basin. My eyes are wild. My hair is a mess. I concentrate on my image as I start to force my breathing back to normal. It takes a while. I stare at myself in the mirror. My reflection is haggard and sticky. He shares my panicked and terrified expression. This shared feeling helps me calm down, and he does too. It's a technique that I developed. A stupid ritual, but it works on nights like this. The dream again. Wretched and so clear. Her words still ring in my ears. It has been a while since my last nightmare. The move must have shook it up to the surface. I slowly regain my control of my breath, even as my heart still pounds in its flight or flight mode, squeezing my eyes closed and splashing more water helps. The cold slows me down. As I feel more myself, I swipe the mirror to status mode. I dry my face with a hand towel. The time is well before dawn. I don't think that I can sleep again after the ordeal, though. I feel grim. 
I saw light open the door, thankful for how silent it is. I cock my ear in the direction of the corridor that leads to my knight's room. He's either a silent sleeper, or these rooms are far more insulated than I thought. Taking my chance, I walk slowly down the corridor to where the bathroom is. Once inside, I take it all in fresh. I hadn't really inspected it before and just passed out after the late meal. It's large and definitely looks fitting for a high-ranking knight. A sink and toilet are on the left side of the room. On the other, a sunken bath sits like a small pool. A sleek-looking high-tech cylinder reflects in the mirrors, dominating the center of the room. White braces split the glass chamber into four parts, rising to meet a white ring at the top. It has far more nozzles and knobs than any that I've seen before, and both curious and mildly fearful of it. Each wall seems to be a visual monitor, though only the left side next to the toilet is active. It displays a forest that seems to stretch far out of sight. As I pass by, the parallax effect kicks in and additional hollow images extend to give the sense of entering the woods. I imagine it's to both be comforting and grant a sense of modesty, but it's currently reminding me too much of my dreams. I look away to instead focus on the challenge before me, the shower. The glass slides apart as I approach and I step inside, which causes the door to close with a soft sound. As the shower hums to life, the nozzles above jostle and pivot, as if waking up and the floor beneath me warms pleasantly. The hollow ring from above descends to just above my head in eager anticipation. A panel shows that the shower can run automatically, but also can be operated manually if needed. I wonder, did he get this installed during his rehab phase to eliminate the need for anyone to help him clean himself? Calbix is proud and hates looking weak. I'm starting to understand. I guess that the daydreams of getting to tend to my night will remain fantasies. Selecting the automatic function of the shower, I hear the machine start up. The nozzles on the sides descend to angle level, like with a whirl, and start shooting hot water. They ascend and rotate around me till I am thoroughly drenched. The apparatus continues rising upward above my head as I realize that I had not entered myself as a new user and the machine was operating on Calvix configuration. With a wet fumble, I turn off the rinse cycle and switch to manual. Having full control now, I maneuver the nozzles and adjust the temperature until the deluge is just right, and I can enjoy the process much more. One of the nozzles dispenses a scented oily gel that has faint grassy notes, and soon the entire chamber smells like a meadow. I can pick out a few additional scents, pine, citrus, as well as some sweet and floral notes. Either way, it smells lovely and I waste no time rubbing it into my scalp. It does not lather much, but it does feel very indulgent to wash a long day and the night sweat away without a time limit. I spend a good deal longer under the spray than I originally intended, but thankfully I feel more calmer by the end of it. Playing with the panel, I figured out that the fan above is an included blow dryer. As I started up, a part of the shower floor opens to suck the water and moisture out through the vents. I think it must be for the fur. I know many races do shed a fair bit, so this must be the best way to clean it up. I'm dry very quickly. It's not as comforting as a shower, though I think I may bring my towels next time and do it the old-fashioned way. But I am clean, dry, and most definitely awake now. Returning to my room, I dress in the expected squire attire. The tight-fitting material clings to the body and leaves little to the imagination, but it's comfortable at least. When we enter battle, we will wear this garment underneath our armor as a conduit between machinery and flesh. Whilst cybernetics like Helbig's eye certainly do have some perks, most species use suits like these to interface with tech rather than directly augment them to the body. The advancement of smart mesh clothing was a fairly big leap in military might. By decreasing the lag to give hepatic feedback almost instantaneously, it allows for far greater mobility and maneuvering. The Agius is also able to work at higher sensitivity. I shiver in part anticipation, part excitement, and part trepidation. It won't be long now till I can make a difference. Speaking of duties, there is one that I should get to. I realize the time is now when I originally intended to wake up. Creeping back out and down the stairs, I am now certain that the rooms must be soundproofed. I am still not about to disturb my night without good cause. Entering the kitchen, I swipe the lights on and survey my kingdom. 
time to make my night's breakfast. I probably should have asked Calvix what he usually eats, but he likely would have declined my offer. I start by opening the various panels, revealing a pretty good selection of grains, produce, and meats. Seeing the large selection of carefully diced and packaged meats makes me think that I should look up a few lupine recipes for some evening meals Calvix couldn't refuse. I find some oats. The package being less than half full makes me think that it is a safe bet. The cooking unit is more advanced than the ones that I have ever used before. After placing a pan on it, the stove material rises and molds around it snugly to hold it in place. The material registers what's placed on it, and with a bit of trial and error, it gets the pot simmering away. In my cabinet raid, I found a pulpy yellow fruit. After slicing it, I find that it has a mildly sweet taste that I think will go nicely as a topping. It might not be elite, but it will at least fill the quota for calories and nutrients. As I spoon the mixture into a larger bowl, I feel somewhat confident that it should be enjoyable. I glance at my STIK for the time, and although I am still early, I do want to find the mess hall. That is, where the other squires and I will normally dine for breakfast. I pick up the bowl and as well as a meal canister that was on the counter and seems to have been prepared the night before. Where should I place it so that he will find it? Maybe I should take it to his room, but that might be a step too far. I might be overstepping right now by invading his space like this. I'll ask him after he gets hooked on Corwin's fancy feasts. I decide to leave the spread on the table that we ate last night. After I set it down, I place a cloche all over the bowl to keep the heat in, and set the canister beside it. Presentation perfect. Satisfied with my efforts, I use the sonic washer to clean the pan. I exit the kitchen and leave the homestead, starting to make my way back to the central building of the complex. As I jog down the street leading to the squire's canteen, the morning light peeks over the houses and the smell of dew and green life springs into my nose. It is so refreshing, so natural. Our moon might have been terraformed partially to accommodate the ev evacuees, but there was always this missing element, this organic feel. Apart from the gravitational comp compensators, you could ignore a lot about moon living, being planetside again, I realized how artificial it really was. With all my thoughts focused on the induction yesterday, I had completely missed it. I slow to a walk and take deep breaths. Last night, dream slips away from my mind as I look around and marvel at what the lupine have done here. The world has been uninhabitable not that long ago. They have truly done wonders to expedite a process that would have taken millions of years naturally, if at all. Atmosphere, core stimulation, weather generation, they had done it all. But then they waited as a flora and fauna, they seeded, stabilized, and acclimated to a world made for them. Afterwards, they finally settled down and built, ingraining all the buildings in the nature that they had propagated. I have to admit, it worked. There was a nice, ascetic ambience, seeing the plants and flowers growing in every corner. Another squire passes by, and I rouse myself from admiring the view. I hurry after them, using them as a guide. I follow them into the hall where the smell and din of breakfast is in full swing. Long tables are filled with squires, most of them from the crop that I had seen the day prior. Older squires might eat later, or with their knights if they are allowed. A bank of machines lines a wall that has a small queue waiting. This appears to be what dispenses meals. The room is filled with a variety of smells that makes a strange and pungent, but not unpleasant aroma. I hurry to the back and study the dynamics that have already formed at the tables. A few clusters of folks look like they know each other well. There are possible friendships risen from the pages having trained together on the same world. Others look chummy, though still polite, as they talk. They likely met on the trip here, and still try to keep up appearances. I fear that I may have missed out this formative experience. There were a few that grouped together based on divisions, and others that mixed. For the most part, though, there is an excited and nervous energy about. I reach the front of the queue whilst amusing and I suddenly realize that I don't know much about how these things operate. The person in front of me has yet to make up their mind. Luckily, I see them slot their STIK into the machine. It then displays a recommended meal for them. The reptilian sticks out his tongue with disdain and then swipes through the menus. They order a different meal entirely. After a satisfied flick, they retract their tongue. The machine, which I now recognize as an assembler, whirls to life with a pleasing series of lights. With a soft peel, a panel slides open to reveal a meal that looks very meaty. 
The squire bops away, happily salivating at his protein-rich offering. With a relative idea of what to do now, I step up and then slide my SDIK into the slot. It takes a moment for the assembler to register me. It calibrates and finally displays a meal. It consists of heated cereal, much like what I prepared for Calvix, along with eggs and some sort of meat. It looks more than enough. Without much preference to go off, I accept the recommendation and move away with a dispensed meal to hunt for a spot to sit as my stomach growls eagerly. Opting to choose an empty space down one end of the table, I dig in and find the meal just as, if not more, tasty than anything that I had during my page years. The meat was spicy, leaving a residual heat that spread through me. A bit of creamy cereal quenched it though, and it was delicious. Should I have prepared more for Calbix? I should actually ask him what he prefers rather than guessing. Or I can ask some of the other squires what their knights eat and work around that. Brooding? Or is your meal so appetizing that everyone else is worth ignoring? I'm pulled out of my thoughts by the bemused face of the man who I bumped into yesterday. Oh, right. He is in the cavalry routine as well. What was his name again? I had tunnel visioned a fair bit during the whole process. Uh, Alexandrite, right? Um, sorry, my head was spacewalking. Uh, everything stellar? He looks down at me. I'll have to get used to the size of all the folks here. His tail alone looks as thick as his arm, though most of the volume could be fur. I had trouble getting a restful sleep. I decided to give up on that endeavor and come down to eat. I see the tip of his tail flick and twitch with annoyance. He is definitely skirting around something. May I join you? Oh, uh, of course, please. I gesture to the bench. He nods before taking the seat, his movements so graceful and practiced. Your night working you hard already? I continue to eat while looking him over. He definitely is a looker and his brow furrowing and that attempt to hide his feelings is rather cute. Your knight was, um, the Urson, right? The, the cannon? That is right. He obviously should have been named Gatling. He snores loudly. The cat looks abashed as if he had just told some dark secret. Ahem. <clears throat> I will adjust. But it was noticeable. I try to stop my mouth from curling into a smile, poorly. Instead, I hide my face behind my beverage before speaking again. That does not sound that bad, I have to admit. It's strange being thrust into duty so rapidly. I thought that there would be some additional tests or screening before we were assigned. His calm eyes lock onto me again, and he studies me curiously. He is a little intimidating, but I make sure to return the gaze. You didn't know? There was a long process to the whole assignment of Squires tonight's. Test scores, temperament, potential, it's all evaluated and then paired with the best match. He looks thoughtfully while he scratches his chin, his whiskers twitch. I know the knights themselves also have a say, considering our tasks. It would be a detriment to the whole operation to have two who don't mesh well. It makes sense, after all squires are the lifeline of the knights as they fly and fight against the plague. I guess I hadn't put that much thought into it. Why do you ask? Are you not pleased with your knight? No, no, it's not it at all. Knight Kelbix is a hero. I couldn't be more pleased by it, but it just feels that like he deserved... better? I mumble a little afterwards and the cat's demeanor softens. Be comforted that they would not put either of you at risk by making a mistake. They must have had a reason to think that it would work, though I am surprised given... Alexandrite, Corwin, good morning to you both. For someone so loud, Zarya sure knows how to pounce in from seemingly nowhere. They both jolt as a tigress slides into a space on the bench. I trust you both settle in well. Relaxing next to Alexandrite, she gives us a nod before taking a deep swig from the canteen that she's carrying. I don't see any other means of nourishment, so I guess her morning meal must be lie within. Just Alex is fine. We are fellow comrades, are we not? Alex raises an eyebrow in good humor and then glances at me as well. Same to you, Corwin. Alex is my preferred means of address. Then Alex it is. Good morning, Zarya. I see you are in high spirits today. 
Zarya grins as she wipes away some of the faintly luminescent liquid from her lips after another drink. That I am. Just came back from a run. Cyrox is a machine. He lapped me twice, round the habitats. I have a long way to go to beat his endurance. She bobs happily. Her energy is contagious and I find myself grinning back as she chugs more of her meal. I am guessing that you are happy with your pairing then? I couldn't be happier. He's strong and he has a gym in his home. You should see the gravitational weight setup he has. The resistance is incredible. I could have pumped all night. She suddenly stops her rambling and blushes. With a small cough, she composes herself. <clears throat> Am. I mean, I am most pleased. I truly feel Cyrox and I are a good match. I am excited to see how much that I can learn from him. Alex gives me a sidelong look. He keeps his face fairly neutral, but his eyes contain a glint of mirth. Oh, you both heard how much you are looking forward to pumping with him all hours of the day and night. I did not say that. You. You. I am not against strangling a cat before noon, you know. She flexes her cybernetic arms threateningly. Alex raises his paws in mock defeat. Ah, Uncia, dear cousin. And no need to be shy. We all know the kind of things that can occur between knights and squires. I don't think anyone would blame you. This time I join Azaria in squawking at how brazen Alex explained it. There were certainly tales of that kind of thing, and it wasn't frowned upon except that it would impact team dynamics. Still though, Zarya's whiskers thrash as she struggles to find words to respond. You... Cousin indeed. I am not after courting my or any other knight. I am strictly wishing to serve our worlds. That can be accomplished without any... extracurricular exercises. She chugs the remainder of a flask and then slams it on the table, which causes the bear approaching us, nervously, to jump about ten feet. Oh, um, did I come at a bad time? I wave the bear over. I recall Zarya greeting him after me, and I suppose that he spotted her and then gravitated his way. He shyly approaches and then sits next to me. I can smell something sweet as he does, his fur is slightly damp. Sorry, Gladius. I was just dealing with this irritant. She glares at Alex, who smiles innocently, as I could imagine, back to her. She huffs frustratingly at him. I see you are all getting along. I hope you don't mind me sitting here. He looks my way, his button ears flattened. Damn, he's adorable. I need to reel it in a notch. Uh, the more the merrier. We're all gonna be spending a lot of time together, so we might as well eat with each other too. Gladius smiles sweetly and nods as a thank to us before he digs into his meal. He similarly has grains, but is topped with a fish with an alluring spice to it instead. Did you settle in well with your knight? You're with a dropship pilot, right? He gulps down a massive bite, almost choking on it as he tries to answer me immediately. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, yeah, I am with Knight Captain Jias. They are something all right wouldn't let me go to sleep until I had correctly identified all the tools in their workshop. He winces, but I see his ears wiggling happily. Maybe it was alright? They have a lot, but they seemed pleased that I know most of them. They showed me how to use the ones that I don't know, and they explained what each is used for. Some were custom made. It was actually pretty fascinating, but... I don't want to push him, so I keep eating and let him decide to finish his thought. Zarya, however, has no such restraint. But what? Surely being paired with a second in command is a great thing. You do not sound as thrilled as I imagined. Gladius winces again and scratches his head. I get another waft of the sweet and damp fur. I look away. It's been a day. Get a grip. Ah, oh, well. I think my pa would want me more in the action. I didn't message to tell him yet. He shrugs and looks at a bracer he wears where I can see his STIK sits. I've seen them before. It's a normal, if bespoke, means to carry one's STIK for easy access. You'll see plenty of action, and you'll be supporting and protecting everyone. I don't think it's a bad placement at all. The bear looks up alarmed and twiddles his thumbs as he stutters. No, it's not that. I mean, I think it's pretty interesting to learn from them and all that. I just have a lot of expectations to meet. 
My pa trained me for frontline combat. A lot. If he has any issue, then he can fume all he wants. Uh, he should be proud that you're in the cavalry, not moaning about what part that you'll be playing, Gladius. The bear looks at me and smiles, despite still looking worried. You can just call me Erix. Gladius is my inspire name. Culture stuff. Dad, fighter, you get it. I raise an eyebrow. I didn't know that about the Ursan system. So few passed through that I never got a chance to really talk to one before. So you all have names for what your parents think you'll be? Sort of. When we come of age, we get our Inspire names. It's supposed to be what we're called from then on, and we pursue our passion. Parents have a say, some more than others, but we also get to choose. Most that enter the KAU get a weapon or tool name. My dad was pretty set for Gladius, and so... He smiles apologetically at me, though I don't know why. His self-esteem could use a kick into gear. Ahem. The table all turns to Alex, and he immediately looks away, embarrassed before continuing. It is not dissimilar to my own culture. My people use uh, precious ores and stones as a naming convention. All kids on my world are born with the name Pebble. As we grow and achieve things, we earn higher standing names. Our leaders are named after the most precious jewels and minerals. They shine bright for all to see and follow. So you're named Alexandrite right now, but in the future you will not be? He nods. Indeed, we often keep meaningful monikers for our own personal lives, but our official nomenclature will ascend or descend depending on the goals that we reach in life. It's fascinating to hear about all these differences in their upbringings. I'm about to ask Alex what he wishes to be called next. That's when Zarya hollers and waves down the other end of the table. Hey, brute! Come sit over here! I turn to see the wolf looking somewhat alarmed at her. I don't blame him. Her display drew a few looks and chuckles. He scans over the table at us. His eyes linger on me for maybe a fraction more than everyone else. Unless that I'm seeing things, he turns and walks out of the hall with his tray without a word. Without even speaking, I still find myself prickling about the attitude of that wolf. You think that I should have been more formal? I don't know. He does have the commander as his knight. He may have other duties to go take care of. Azaria continues to watch the door he left through for a moment, her lips purse as if holding back some choice words, before she pivots back around to us. Maybe. Anyway, I'm gonna run back, grab my stuff, and have a quick wipe down. See you later, lads! She slides out and then leaps up with an expert grace and power before jogging off. I marvel at her energy. We finish up our respective meals and then Alex leads us over to clear our trays. There is a machine that recycles any waste put in next to the assemblers. I think that it looks like a baby bird with the way that it parts clothes happily after each offering. Heading out, we join the throng of other squires. Circling the path around the building, we reach the main entrance that we entered yesterday after landing. I see the different divisions moving to other buildings to undergo their own specialized training. As we enter the hallways, a locator on my STIK screen shows me the room to head to. Happily, Alex and Erix are in the same cluster and we end up together in a similar room to the one that we were in before. The floor has been adjusted to a more spongy material, and the opposite wall shows cabinets of weapons of various sizes and types. It's all so tantalizingly close to us. I look over them greedily. There's a far change from the rudimentary training tools that we've had access to as pages. These look well-worn, sturdy, and even lethal. I itch to pick one up. However, none of the others were, though they were looking as eager as I, with the exception perhaps of Eryx, who looked nervous. A shame, given that he would be quite the imposing figure if he stood straight. The door opens again, and Zarya bounds in with a look of eager joy, the collective share of a shudder at the thought of her pounding someone mercilessly in a sparring match. Brute walks in as well, but my scoff dies in my throat as Commander Fen marches in. Wall! Now! There's a hurried scrambling as we all line up against the wall behind us. Ben imposingly marches up and down the line a few times, his eyes darting over each of us. I can almost feel myself lose a few inches as his gaze passes over me before moving on. 
This room will be your temple for the foreseeable future. You will train here. You will sweat here. You will bleed here. He strides about, clearly in full speech mode. His eyes keep drilling us, predatorially, looking for any flinches or weakness. I force myself to keep still, only following him with my eyes. As I informed you all yesterday, the KAU may have determined your merits to be here, but that means kibble to me. You are nothing more than tools to be used to end this insufferable siege. Some of you may become knights, may, but I will be damned if I let a single weak link break our formation. We are what separates systems and planets from complete harvest. We are the ones who initiate the majority of engagements in this quadrant, and we are the ones who will take the losses. And I will not accept losing. He swivels to face us all and snarls. I am glad that I am not the only one to jump. I feel a pang of sympathy for the few squires who get a degree of spit from his shouts in their eyes. As far as I am concerned, you are glorified medipacks. You keep us in the game so that the real fight can still be fought. That being said, you will be expected to fight. I will crash my ship straight through whatever afterlife you believe in and kill your asses again if any of you die to foot soldiers. You will learn to shoot, fight, and defend to the level that I expect. You will hold the line and assist, but make no mistake that your main concern is to live. For us. For the Agis. Behind him, the floor recedes, and then a structure rises out of it. The ability to reshape and alter the room would have gotten my attention, but the thing rising up is far more attention-grabbing. It has a mannequin-like body with a glowing core and a transparent amoeba-like membrane covering it. It's off-putting because it's faceless and amorphous. He taps a chest piece of the device with a single claw, and all our eyes stare at it. I've never actually seen an active one so close before. But this is it. Our biggest purpose and privilege. I know you all are aware, but this tech was truly the turning point in our chances against the plague. We lost plenty of good soldiers beforehand, and training was a mad dash to get spaceborne again. We all listen, enraptured, even as he shakes his head at the loss of so many. We have all lost someone. Some much more than others. This link between knights and squires has become the cornerstone of our ability to keep fighting. You are what makes this work. Knights rely on squires to share the pain when we are bombarded, shot at, injured. You keep us alive. He gives us all a look that I can only call contempt. Maybe distrust? So let's get this clear. That does not make you special. It makes you exceptional. I'd rather burn through a hundred squires if it meant one knight remains flying. It takes years to get to the level required to fight the plague. If, and I mean if, you all survive long enough to rise those lofty ranks, then you will do it knowing the pain that we all go through. There is a tangible feeling of unease and some sickened looks. Ben's attitude makes sense, but he is so callous about it, it's hard to stomach hearing it so blatantly. The first thing that you have to get used to is this primary duty. Ben heads over to the left wall, panel, which retracts as he approaches. A row of harnesses can be seen within. After taking one out, he swipes his STIK at it. He then points it towards the dummy that pulses in response. Right, who's first? His eyes shine with malice glee as he surveys us like prey. He locks onto Eric's and raises an eyebrow, seeing how nervous he looks before he can zero in. Zarya steps forward. It would be my honor, Commander. She beats her chest once. I'm not sure if she noticed Eric's or just genuinely wanted to be first. Ben stalks over to her and then hands her the harness. Very well. On with it. She puts the harness on. Once fastened, the loose straps tightened and adjust to her frame. After they finish, the piece in the center pulses and glows. I assume that means it is active. I watch, like the others, Morbidly fascinated. We hadn't had the tech on Foro. Instead, we use weak buzzers to simulate the edges during practice drills. That became easy to ignore. Fen had retreated to the wall, and it comes back with a short baton. Well, it looked short in his large paws. He spins it effortlessly. It glows with soft yellow lights. Light-based weaponry. It made sense since he, hopefully, wasn't trying to do serious harm. Zarya stands opposite of the dummy and looks expectantly at the commander. He gauges her for a moment. Then, with a burst of speed, he thrusts forward. 
The tip of the baton leaves a trail of light in its wake. Fen's expression is steely and focused. There is a beauty to it. The motion of his jab is elongated by the trace and emphasizes Fen's form. At first, I think that he is going to hit Zarya with it. He pivots at the last second and ramps the baton deep into the transparent guts of the dummy. There is a moment where nothing happens. Maybe time slows down. I can see the impact of the baton inside the membrane, a burst of light that ripples out, and then the core flashes in response. As it does, the plate on Zarya's lights up as well. Her fur stands straight up as it, she spasms, her body instinctively trying to escape the pain. Rah! The sound is ripped out of her. Her arms briefly pulse with an angry purple before flickering out. She breathes deeply, flexing her arms like she's trying to work out a cramp. It's a very impactful display. There is more than a little fidgeting as the rest of us realize that it's only a matter of time before our own introduction to the device's capabilities. You handled that well, Squire Malrexis. Fall back in line and pass the training gear to whichever of your fellow squires you want to follow suit. Zarya turns back to us, a very apologetic look on her face as she still calms her breaths down. With a final inhale, she decouples a harness from herself and then passes it to Alex. He puts it on without a hint of protest and then moves up in front. Fen proceeds to continue his introduction of the squires without remorse. Squire after squire fall under his baton strike, delivered to the dummy, sending the shared portion from the edges to them. Some bear it better than others, but everyone reacts. This is likely the first time many felt it, and the mounting responses are making me nervous. The pool of remaining squires shrinks, taking the plunge before being last would be best. I'd hate to faint or be the only one unable to handle it. Eryx is up next. He takes the pain with a heavy grunt and a sniffle. He starts shaking as he turns to look over the last remaining squires. Me and Fen's asshole of a squire. Luckily, Eryx reads my pleading look and offers me the harness. His paws are shaking and he's panting as he does so. You got this. His whisper is barely audible as he passes it to me. I get myself into it. The size difference between us is almost comical, but I don't laugh. As the bands rapidly shrink from the bear's much broader frame to mine, I steal my nerves. Fen regards me, spinning the baton in a lazy half-circle, with the same look that he gave me the day prior. I'm not about to question it. I take my spot and stand to attention, waiting for the inevitable. The commander is far from accommodating. It's almost as if he's expecting my resolve to crumble. It's agonizing. He draws out the moment, almost to my breaking point. He finally strikes. Even after all the others, his speed is shocking and explosiveness. His baton is already embedded in the dummy before I have time to register the attack, the glow on my chest activating a second after. My vision nearly whites out. I feel it like my body is on fire. The pain spreads out from my chest to every extremity, as if every single atom of my being has been personally attacked. Ah! I scream. This is no embarrassment, because others had, but my legs are buckling. As my body recoils with the pain, all my willpower goes to trying not to fall. I cannot force my knees to remain locked. They give in. I do go down, not hard, not entirely on the floor, but on my knees. I use my right hand to brace myself from falling flat. The pain ricochets through me, waves more intense than I'd ever felt. I am immediately sweating as a convulsion still pulse through me. I can feel the stares of the others. No one else fell. My face starts to heat up and I push myself to my feet. I hope to regain what remains of my dignity by standing at attention, though I still tremble slightly. Fen is looking at me with a satisfied smirk. Was he wanting me to fall? Or would he have been satisfied with anyone going down? My mind is reeling too much to really think about it more. Hmm. Brute, I expect you to show me how it's done, considering who you represent. His squire waits for me to take off the harness. My arms do so robotically. It's easier to stare at Brute's stoic face than the others. I focus on him. He'd be attractive if he wasn't such an ass. He takes the harness and slings it on in a singular motion. As I slink back to stand with the others, I avoid meeting anyone's gaze as I try to play it off as nothing. Right then. Rah! Ben slams his weapon into the dummy with much more aggression. I didn't think that he could swing harder than he had already been doing. 
I still feel the burn of failure and pain buzzing in my head, but I swear he hit the dummy with more force. It also doesn't make me feel any better when Brute takes it with only the slightest shift and grunt. The best reaction by far. Finn gives Brute a nod of approval. I could just die now. Maybe I did, and this is how my body is dealing with me my passing. By torturing me in my final moments. Well, there we have it. Some impressive resilience shown. Some less so. I shrink even more internally, trying to maintain my stance. I am still twitching from the pain and feel even more heat on my neck. But it does not mean squat. How well you took it now. Out there, in action, you'll be taking more. Worse. As much as we say that we are the best pilots in the fleet, and we are, there is no certainty in warfare. We fly our best and do our best. If all goes well, that means we all come back home. As he's talking, the beta dummy recedes into the floor, and then the padded matting slides back into place. You, of course, will be expected to engage as well, be it orbital or ground support. You will be fighting. You will endure when we are hit, while also staying safe. This is the choice that you all made. I will suffer no delusions that this isn't the most intense faction of the fleet, in terms of what we expect. He turns his back to us and walks to the weapon cabinet once more, returning with an additional baton. He swings both of them lazily. To that end, now that you're all awake and warmed up, there's no better time to let me personally evaluate your fighting prowess. I will say it again. It does not mean shit how amazing you think you were back in your cribs. Here, I only care what I see myself. He brings back the batons to a smooth stop and points each one out. One is aimed at Brute and the other squarely at me. Since you two were the last to face the blows, it seems fair to let you be the first to spar. Use the fresh pain and adrenaline to give us a good display, right? He cocks his head as he surveys the two of us, a smirk across his muzzle. I am now certain that he's targeting me, though I am not sure why he would, beyond the fact that I am the only human in the mix. I feel the need to prove myself. I tussled with plenty of partners larger than Brute as a page, even if he does look exceptionally well built. I think that I have a chance. Without a grumble of hesitation, I stride forth and take the baton from the commander's right paw. His grip lingers a moment longer than it should. I stumble ungracefully as I take my position on the mat. Brute stands opposite me, his muzzle in that cocky sneer of his. I can't wait to wipe it off his face. I ignore that and concentrate firstly on the weapon in my hands. Although my baton was by no means an irregular tool we used as pages, they were far more rudimentary. I wanted to examine it fully. A sleek mat with a rivet that runs up the shaft. It has a nice heft to it. I feel a sliding switch along the handle, small enough that my thumb could easily move it up or down. Each direction allows the device to switch modes. As you are all aware, our biggest and greatest means to damage the Plague Bastards is a light and heavy weapon systems. His utter hatred for the Plague is clear from the way he speaks, most of us rumbling in agreement. To illustrate his point, he plucks the baton out of my hands and flicks the handle switch. The baton is illuminated with that yellow glow again. He proceeds to make a flurry of attacks in the air next to me. I'd be lying if I said that he wasn't impressive. Each jab is measured and flows to the next. This close, I can feel the heat of him as he puts forth the display. Fast, agile, lighter. Using the inverse mass law, we can use light tech to accelerate our weapons and ballistics to the speed of light or close to it. He comes to a finish after a few final jabs and then twirls the baton as he resets it. Only then does he place it back in my hands. As he does, I can see how his huge paw dwarfs my hand. He moves off, circling around the outside of the padded area. You can move and strike exceptionally fast with light tech, but remember that the faster you go, the less impact that they will be. Less mass, less damage. Good for controlling a situation and to pin them down, but you'll want to use heavy hits for the kill. By this point, he's looped around to Brute and takes his baton. When he activates the baton this time, it hums and glows with a deep purple light. He starts swinging again, but the difference is noticeable. Even though he makes a flurry of attacks with the smoothest of practice and expertise, he's easier to follow. Heavy, or gravitational, tech increases the potential mass. That means each impact is heavier and deals far more damage. You can strike deep and hard, crushing or breaking apart armor or plating with these. Land a blow with a heavy attack and they will 
be reeling if not dead. He makes a few aggressive lunges and swings with it. The force behind it is evident, and the control he exhibits in control to direct the movements is remarkable, begrudgingly so. But it's slow and cumbersome. It takes strength and knowledge to land a hit. The bastards will certainly see any obvious attacks coming, so making it count is what matters most. He finishes his display and then tosses a deactivated baton back to Brute. The more you train, you will find which side you lean towards when it comes to proficiency and accuracy. However, you will be expected to, and shall, be competent with both. Eventually, weaving and altering between the two techs will be how you stop being a novice and inch towards becoming a proper squire. Not that they will come soon. So. He gestures to the both of us. All eyes return to us. I feel his demonstration has helped me calm back down, even with the nerves of doing this in front of others. I'm breathing normally now. Each of you choose a setting. The batons are capped on how much they can output. So use whichever you feel confident with. Show me something that makes you worthy of being here. Brute does not hesitate. He grins as his baton lights up purple, then grunts as he lets the arm holding it hang by his side. I can see his muscles straining not to drop it. He looks at me challengingly, mocking me to dare to do the same. I don't rise to the bait, instead activating my baton to the soft yellow. I immediately feel how much lighter it is. Alarmingly so, it feels as if I'm holding nothing at all. The sensation is throwing me off. I slide the setting down a few ticks till the baton has a monochrome of its previous weight on. Brute's smirk widens and I can see Commander Fenn standing off to the side with the others. His arms are crossed and he watches with amusement. I'm going to wipe all the smirk off of his face. I give the baton a brief whirl like Fenn did. It helps me get a little familiar with the weight, or lack thereof, still in the tool. I crouch slightly and wait as Brute widens his stance as well. The other's eyes fade away as it all comes down to me and him. Begin! Brute dashes forward, much faster than I expected. He swings the baton overhead in an arc. He is compensating for the added weight with centrifugal force. I manage to leap to the side in time, hearing and feeling the hum of it swinging past me. One clean hit from that and it's all over. As I duck and move around behind the wolf, I take a jab at his right side. The baton glides forward like it's the one leading my arm before I can register the motion it connects. Bap. It was so quick that I am still mid-thrust. I strike him with a few more quick, safe jabs. They all connect, but he barely grunts. I dart back across the match to create space between us, waiting for his next move. Brut looks at me as he snarls. He's not in pain, he's more annoyed at the fact that I hit him. The training weapons we had at Foro were just metal pipes of varying densities to simulate the feeling. In reality, it's so vastly different. I feel a bubble of anger at how underprepared I am. Fen was right, the light attacks are fast, but dainty in comparison. I have already seen how much Brute can take from this type of assault. I need to hit something vital or hit harder. Brute doesn't give me much time to ponder my options, though, as he hunkers low and twirls his body around to advance on me with more intensity. Grrrah! Forget attacking, this crazy wolf has me on the back pedals. It takes all the concentration to avoid the purple rod jabbing at me. Wait. Whoop. Gah! The momentary distraction slows me and eclipses my left wrist. My baton flies out of my hand as I tumble back and roll away. I scramble to my feet to prepare for a follow-up blow. My arm throbs. There's no way that I can hold a baton properly now. My eyes quickly scan for the weapon. Brute stands between me and it, rolling his shoulder and grimacing as he moves his baton into the other hand. The weight is no doubt starting to wear on him. If I can get mine back, maybe I can find an opening. I want to shake off my arm, but I am fairly sure it's fractured or worse. I cradle it against my body to limit jostling it. Fuck, it hurts. My eyes water and I blink rapidly to clear them. Brute takes his chance to advance on me. I dive out of his wide swing and yell in pain, rolling to the side to reach for the baton, my fingers close around the handle. Crack. A sickening sound followed by a surge of pain erupts from my shoulder and traveling down my body. The residual vibrations make my bones scream. Something's broken. I bite my lip hard to stop a full cry from coming out. Blood spills into my mouth as I puncture it, the taste coppery and bitter. I try to roll away again in case that he strikes once more, but his foot blocks me. He stands over me, his baton rests on his shoulder almost lazily, even as he pants and looks down. Well, not bad. Certainly a good show of making the most of what you can do. 
Getting disarmed in battle is a death sentence, and you, Runt, are most certainly dead. I am not sure which is worse, the pain or the humiliation. No, the pain. The pain is worse. Brute offers me no paw, but I would refuse him anyway. Neither arm is much of use now. I am not about to make this a complete day of failure, though. I grunt through the pain enough to push myself up. Hmm. No sense having you cry in the corner and put everyone off their game. Go to the med bay. It's down the hall. Then hit the showers. No point in coming back afterwards. I wish a chasm would open and swallow me whole, but I stand properly and give a sloppy, painful salute. Aye, Commander. I say with a trickle of blood down my chin, but he doesn't address it. I turn and stride out of the room as straight-backed as I can. All right, next up. You and you, front and center. The door closes before I can hear more. I slump against the wall, tears spilling freely now. I made an utter shit show of myself in there, an embarrassment not only myself, but Calvix as well. Word will get out. What if I get dismissed for being so obviously a mistake? I dry heave. The taste of blood is replaced with bile as I throw up on the floor and wall. The only thing keeping me from collapsing is the knowledge that I would not get back up again. What a fucking day. The wall beside me starts to slide apart, and I force myself out of it. The vacant space allows a small army of cleaning bots to spill out and start attacking my offering with joyful tenancy. I assume that I am not the first to besmirch these hallways with their breakfast. The thought makes me feel a tiny bit better, and I watch the industrious machines for a moment longer. My shoulder and wrist soon start to insist that we get a move on with fresh pulses of pain. I push myself away and walk down the hall to the med bay to lick my wounds. Or maybe a cute nurse would. Cochino. I watch my blood swirl down the drain as the water cascades over my head and drowns out my thoughts. The medical team was top-notch and they weren't surprised by my state as they patched me up. My wrist wasn't any issue, but my shoulder needed the better part of an hour. I still have to patch over the area. The gel-like product is doing its work on reducing the residual pain. My ego, though. That wound is deep and as therapeutic as the water feels, it doesn't wash away the clawing feeling of defeat and humiliation that crashes over me in waves. I slap my hand on the panel angrily and take the glob of gel that spurts out and scrub my hair aggressively. Even through my rage cleaning, I hear the main door open. Chatter waltzes in with the other squires, interrupting my sulking solitude. I slow down and try to appear more nonchalant, but even I don't buy the act. There you are, Corwin. Are you alright? Zarya strides in to the showers and then besides me, ignoring other squires as she passes. She's already nude, but her arms give her the appearance of still wearing sleeves. Her eyes travel across my torso to my shoulder and then lock onto the patch. See? I told you, Alex. He broke something. I almost lost it when I heard the crack. I swear he was going for a break. Total asshole. Alex is further behind because he is still stripping. It gives me a moment to look her over. Apart from the fact that I don't see any ounce of fat, my heart deflates a little at the fact that she doesn't have any injuries from her bout. Or does she? I see her fur is matted on her neck. And it was a bit swollen? A lucky hit, maybe. She catches me, staring and rubs the spot, wincing and then moving under a cascade herself. Yeah, I know. Collarbone got whacked. The... Krokuda lad gave up using the baton when I pinned him down and then started punching me instead. Guess I scared the fella. <laughs> oh, wow. At least you won. The words slipped out from me before I could hold him back. I think you did amazing. He was out for blood and you managed to dodge so fast I couldn't keep up. If I had been against him, I would have been on the floor the second the match started. The bear chips in as he continues to take the spot on the other side. His lips and nose are busted, but all in all, he doesn't look too bad. They were the only injuries that I could see. As if reading my mind, he scratches his face, embarrassed. Not that I fared better in my match. Alex is kind of a beast. He leans in to whisper, and it does make me feel a bit better, though him leaning close did give me an eyeful of what other weaponry he had. Not that I was staring or anything. Well, not that much. I had the upper hand, Eric's. I've trained with that model of weapon before, and I spent many sparring sessions using it. If you had chosen to swing at me with a heavy configuration, I would have been more cautious. The Immaculate Leopard 
joins in and basks in the shower adjacent to us. I am not a prude, but I do spot a glint from below that makes me, my eyes wander. Uh, I wish that I had seen it. I wish that I had seen all of you in action. Zarya hardly slaps on my back with a wet paw. You will, though I will not promise that I won't put you on your ass myself. I won't go that easy on you. If you treat him like a child, he'll die like one crying on the battlefield. There goes any small buoyancy that I had started to feel. The wolf stalks in and then starts lathering up. Even with the other stall starting to fill, he chooses some distance between us all. We are supposed to be the elite after all. Can't expect anyone to go easy on you. If they do, it's not a kindness. And yet, you'd rather us be killed off or crippled before we even get to fight? Come off of it, wolf. We're supposed to be all in this together. She flicks water at him, but he ignores her and just scoffs. Yeah, exactly. We have to have one another's back. You expect me to trust some wimp who breaks under a little pressure? Eric shrinks as I do. At that comment, our gleaming tigress, though, is still on the offensive. I trust him a fair bit more than you right now, that's for sure, feral dog. Watch it, you armless pussy. He snarls back and starts to advance. His arm is snagged by Alex, who is looking at Brute's close fist with a cool demeanor. What do you got there, Brute? He squeezes the wolf's paw. Brute tries to yank it back, but struggles against Alex's grip. Brute finally wrenches himself free and then clutches his paw to his chest defensively. Bit uncouth of you to bring your SDIK into the showers, don't you think? Military hidden holovids are a little on the muzzle. A few others stare after overhearing that, and there's a murmur of discomfort. A few squires even cover themselves up with their paws or towels. Brute looks around as if expecting to be attacked, his ears flattened down. Don't get any fancy ideas. I just don't want to leave my stuff lying around to be snatched. You gotta have a planet-sized ego if you think that you'd be filming any of you fuckers. Backing up, still soapy, Brute retreats. He leaves the room after grabbing his clothes and towel, leaving a wet trail after him. The situation changes so fast that I barely process it. Hey, Corwin. I blink and then look over at him. Alex just flicks his ears, free of some errant droplets, and smiles. We don't always make the best first impressions, but hard work usually changes that. I think you have that kind of fortitude, so don't let this get you down. Yeah, yeah, I'll try, Alex. Thanks for that. I just don't like dicks. Giving a glance around the showers, where many nude squires were currently showing their instruments, I turn back to face him and raise an eyebrow. He blushes profusely and practically dives back under the watery spray. No, I meant... I didn't... Oh, go jump out of an airlock, human. I chuckled at that, and a few others join in. The tension breaks, and my spirit is definitely a little confused, but lifted. The walk back to Kalbex's place certainly drains my mood, though. The thought of having to face Kalbex after my poor showing, or worse, having to tell him if he hadn't heard already, is making my stomach churn. My pace slows as I prolong facing him. What am I going to say after touting myself up so much, claiming that I wanted to be treated like a true squire and then proceeding to humiliate us both not a day later? Even a shuffle can't stop the inevitable. Sure enough, I'm at the porch of his home. I take a few breaths, trying to calm the fluttering on my chest and stomach. What even happens to squires who are dismissed? Do they leave in disgrace or get put on the train duty out until the war is over? I'd rather do that than let Maro see me. To hammer home my feelings of failure, the smell and sounds of sizzling meat assaults me the second that I open the door. My stomach doubles down on clenching, now with added hunger. My resolve is about to crumble. I start to slink towards the stairs when Kalbix's voice calls out from the kitchen, stopping me dead in my tracks. Corwin, you're back. I'm aware that you wanted to do more around the house, but my drill's wrapped up early. I cannot escape now, so I make my way into the kitchen. My knight has made a protein-rich meal with meat. I'm thrown from my pity party by the sight before me. My mind had so defined Kelvix as a knight that I could not comprehend the concept of him in casual attire and what a view. His relaxed look gave him a much more approachable feel. With his arms exposed, my eyes see parts where his fur hasn't fully grown over the scars. That doesn't distract from how well built he is. Holy fuck. I must be drooling because Kalbix cracks a smile when he sees me. No need to look that hungry. 
It's not much, just what I carved after an intense day when I was a squire. His words bring me back down with a thud. Yeah, an intense day alright. My face must have soured because he looks at me worried. You're not against meat, are you? I didn't really check. I can make something else if you prefer. He looks so crestfallen that I feel even worse. No, no, not at all. It smells incredible, sir. It's just... I take a deep breath. I fucked up. We had training today with the Hadris and then some sparring. I put on a shit show. I fell and was beaten. I embarrassed myself. And worst of all, you. The words come out gushing out of me. I'm horrified that they don't stop as I start to shudder. I'm so sorry, sir. I just want to show myself worthy of being here and being your squire. Instead, I... I failed. Shit, I wanted to be this. I thought I could. Tears start falling from me traitorously as I try to wipe them off nonchalantly with my elbow, even as my voice cracks and I'm still shaking. Calbix is just staring at me. He hasn't moved aside from his ears, which twitch and flicker with each sniff and word. His eyes are locked on me and I feel even smaller. Um, he must be furious. He places the bowls on the counter and then walks towards me. God, the sullen disapproval is killing me. Just yell. Just punch me. Spit on me. Tell me how much that I have dishonored the uniform. As he stands in front of me, he's silent. I can't meet his eyes. I stare at the ground waiting for something, anything. I'm pulled forward. A colossal paw on my head pushes me against his chest. His left paw pats my back, almost knocking the wind out of me. It's warm. I'm stunned. My brain cannot handle the dissonance between what I was expecting and this comforting feeling. How many years has it been since I was just held like this? I can't remember. I've been manhandled before in more primal ways, but simply held like this? He smells of pine and something earthy. There's a touch of sweat beneath the cologne. He'd also been working hard all day after all. Ah, is that it? We can't all leave the dock flying straight as an arrow. He's still patting me, though I can still feel his grip. It's not firm. He isn't forcing me to stay. I can pull back, I can tell. But it's too nice, and it hides a teary face, so I stay. None of us expect fresh squires to know everything to be hardened soldiers without a shred of weakness. It's why we train. Day one should not color your entire career. His words are soothing, though part of me rejects them. I need to show them that I can do this. I am not a liability. I am not weak. I push myself away and squarely look up at him. You don't understand. I'm small, er, than others. I don't have any evolutionary advantages, no enhanced senses to give me an edge. I can't let myself fall behind. I have to show that I am worthy of you, that I can support you out there, that you can trust me. It's what I'm supposed to be. He gives me a sad gaze. Even his cybernetic eye matches his real one and the expression. I think that I'd rather he be angry at me. This feeling of being pitied is unbearable. Well, maybe. Keep working hard and you will improve. All those years as a page will show through. Others will be better in some areas, but you will excel elsewhere. I am sure. He sheepishly looks to the side as he continues. And if you are worried about the edges, don't be. I don't have any intention of you ever being linked to me in combat. Instantly, I feel like I've been smacked by a brute again. My stomach drops and I go cold. He never wants to link with me. You don't want me to link with you? But I'm... I sputter as he looks at me, uncomfortable. He doesn't trust me. After what he just said, and then he slaps me like that, I feel like I have whiplash. My one purpose is to help you in battle, and I'm not... You won't... Why? It's the whole reason that I'm here. You just said that I'll get better. I'll train. I'll practice taking blows. I'll... No. He looks angry. So am I, Furball. I'm just a hindrance, then. I am just a weak human and a burden. I am not good enough to even be used as fodder. Kelbix flattens his ears as my voice hitches higher. I start yelling more. The feeling of inadequacy that have been building cascades around me. They are fueling my anger as I see all my insecurities manifest before me. Well, fuck. Fuck. What am I even doing here? 
I work so hard and now I can't even perform the basic duties. You cook and take care of yourself so well that you don't need me. I might as well be a pet for all that I'm worth. What point is there? I can't. Why? Fuck this. I can't. I turn around and flee the kitchen before I can fully break down. I can't do it in front of him again. Corwin, wait! I don't. I take the stairs two at a time. I throw myself into my room. I slam the door behind me and then sink to the floor with my back against it. Great. I just acted like a child. What the fuck is wrong with me? Has this whole thing been a mistake? Why has it upset me so? Was my pride so fragile that I couldn't take no blows to it? Alone, I wallow in my misery. Calbix does not come to see me. Why would he? He rejected the core of our dynamic downstairs. Brute enters my thoughts with a shadow of Commander Fen leering behind him. The two of them thoroughly prove to everyone how behind I am. Who could I even be mad at for that? They were right after all. I've been so proud of myself with all that I achieved as a page, but it meant nothing in the face of everything else. Who could I even blame? My backwater system with next to no resources still recovering from the attack? Or maybe my instructors? Or the lack of anyone's really serious about the same goals as me? At the end of the day, I only have myself to blame. I hug my knees tight to my chest, curling into a ball as my sobs devolve into sniffles. I feel pathetic. Usually, I would be over with the morrows, chatting and venting to help get over the latest setback. I don't want to message him. What could he even say that would help? He'd just say that I should deal with the issue head on. Apparently, it's my forte. So... I'm weak. I'm humiliated. My knight doesn't even want to let me help. I made a scene in front of him. What do I do? Only one of these issues has an obvious course of action. I'm weak. I just have to not be. I need to concentrate on that and move forward. I look out the window and see the targets below. They're battered, littered with the marks of constant use. How much had Kelvix gone through after his recovery to make it back to active duty? Hours? Days? Weeks? No, months, surely. Years, maybe. I was here after a single setback, and I let everything collapse around me. No, I can fix one thing, if only for my own peace of mind. Train. Train more than anyone else. Catch up. Overtake. Prove them all wrong. Squeeze every extra minute out of the day, and put it into improving. Win over the commander. Win over Calbix. Make them acknowledge me. Maybe apologize to Calbix at some point for flipping out? Maybe. I wait until it's well past dusk to head out. Calbix went to bed early. I'm not sure if that is normal, or if I made him feel bad. I creep down the stairs and slip out the door as quietly as I can. I thank the lupine engineers as the door glides open like a whisper. Although it is dark, there are a few street lamps lighting the way. The view of the stars above is spectacular. All forms of pollution, including light, are not allowed on any of the engineered planets. It really is a sight looking up into the sky and seeing the boundless beauty of the finite. I make the jog back towards the circular buildings in the distance, passing by some others doing the same. In addition, there are some squires doing nighttime routines, drills, and there are some who are simply walking about. The dimly lit buildings greet me as I see a small flurry of drones soaring through the area, weaving and folding in on themselves like a murmuration of birds. They're oddly hypnotic to look at. Leaving the happy swarm to their various vegetation maintenance, I make my way inside. Retracing the routine that we'd taken earlier, I find my way to the room of my shame. I stare at the spot where my bile had painted the wall and floor. It's spotless now, latent memory making my nose wrinkle. Fingering the STIK, I request access. I cite training as a reason, and the door slides open. I'm shocked by the sound coming from within. Peeking into the lit room, I see... The lunging Ursa in form of Eric's grunting with exertion. The smell of effort already permeates the room. Ha! <laughs> yeah! Urgh! He is swinging a thick practice sword with a large motion. His fur is dripping in sweat. He spots me standing indecisively in the doorway. Corwin? He stumbles in an effort to turn his body to face me. In doing so, he ends up toppling over and onto his rear with a heavy thud. I wince and then go over to offer a hand to pull him up. He takes it, embarrassed. S sorry. I was just, um... 
How long were you watching me? He stammers out with a squeak, a blush rising to his cheeks as he takes my hand. He heaves himself up to his feet, almost taking me off balance. Oh, uh, like a second? I just opened the door. See you, and well, I was gonna sneak in some extra practice. But then I saw you, and I didn't expect to see anyone else, and I just froze. My rambling peters out for a moment. We both stand awkwardly. The only sound in the room is Eric's panting as he catches his breath. Oh, I was kind of doing that too. <laughs> he chuckles. The blush still tints his face as he avoids making eye contact. You didn't see it as you were, well, out, but my match was abysmal. My father would be upset if he'd seen it. Alex just moves so fast and gracefully. I would have loved to see Alex's movements myself. I'm sure that taunt body would be quite a sight to see in motion. I thought that I should do some extra training. My family was always drilling me late into the evening, doing swings and stuff, against an actual moving enemy. Well... He shrugs and sniffs as his breathing starts to come back to normal. I won't lie, it kind of feels good to see that I am not the only one feeling dejected. That being said, Eryx is built so well, even under his cuddle layer of padding, his body is jacked. If he feels behind, I am leagues below that. I shake my head to clear my thoughts. No, no more wallowing. I... Well, you saw me. I feel the same. I'm behind, barely held it together, and then ended up getting killed by the enemy. I need to get better. I want to go through the same steps myself. I find I'm lacking in a lot of areas that I thought I excelled at. I can't let ca uh, my knight or myself down. Eric solemnly nods, though he does cock his head a little afterwards. I think you did alright, really. Brute is, well, he's something. But you still lasted longer than me and some others. I'm slow. It doesn't really matter if you have some strength. If you can't even land a hit. He flexes his arms, but then deflates. His belly wobbles just enough to make my inner desire twitch, but I subdue it. He looks at me bashfully and wrings the hilt of the sword in his grasp. Do, do you want to train with me for a bit? He squeaks again, but really it's adorable. He makes me feel confident even though I'm still on the edge of being bummed. I would be honored to train with you, Eryx. Maybe we can go through some moves and stances. I don't recall ever seeing any Ursin drills. He looks lovably elated. He beams at me. Sh sure thing. I'm no expert, but I can show you some stuff, and you can show me some of those rolls you did. They were really cool. It's my turn to blush as I nod, eager to get started in a forward direction. It takes a few hours, but we are well and truly spent by the end of it. Eric's might not have the speed, but boy does he have the stamina and strength. He almost hit me a few times. After the first near miss, he apologizes and worried that I'd be hurt. After begging him to not hold back, we both got a real workout. Most of it was me dodging the various blows and strikes he threw at me. Eric's style was not very graceful at all. The sweeping blows were easily telegraphed, and even with a few mixed swings he threw in, I could predict everything by the end. It was hard, though. I could feel the power behind the swings and knew one was all that it would take to knock me down. That was without even using heavy enhanced weaponry. Ha! <sighs> Take this, then! As he smiles and takes another swing, I can see the Ursaran style was definitely designed with longevity in mind. He wears down opponents until they can make a make single mistake. His eyes are always trained on me, even as his body slowly moves to follow my newest dodge or fent. His eyes track me very well. It's almost unsettling. We both end up lying on the mat panting. I'm not sure how much improvement we made, but it felt good to just physically exert oneself, a small feeling of accomplishment. I think... yeah, I think I'm done. Me too. I could fall asleep right here. Well, if the thought of je I mean, the night captain getting angry and jettisoning me mid-exceed didn't chill me to the bone. I force myself to stand, even though my body protests. I hobble towards the door, followed by my bear in arms. We are siblings bound in mutual suffering. We make our way out of the diamond halls. We pass a few other squires and personnel, but I recognize no one. 
By the time that we exit the building into the nice cool air, we both have our breath back. We walk in comfortable silence towards the housing area for a while. Thank you. He blurts out after we reach an intersection. I jump at the sudden break from the quiet. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, what for, though? Well, for training with me, and for not, uh, you know, laughing at me or anything. Why would I laugh at you, Eriks? Fuck, man, I think that you're a good fighter. I learned a lot from you. Thank you for letting me join in. He grins and scratches his neck. Heh. <laughs> yeah, well, any time, Corwin. It felt good to train with someone who didn't, well, slap me about for just being slow. I wince and pat his side. He jolts but relaxes soon after. I'll happily train with you again. I need it, really. We chuckle a bit and Eric's points down a different junction. Yeah, thanks again. Um, well, I'm this way. Catch you tomorrow, Corwin. Thanks. Sorry, I just said that. He's definitely blushing, though I think the dark because I am as well. He sure knows how to get me to grin. Sure thing, Eric's. Sleep well. I wave him off and then head back to Calvix's house. Maybe I can get a different type of workout with Eric's if he keeps acting so cute. God damn, you keep it in your pants! Horny thoughts have to wait. I'm tired and aching. I sneak into the house and creep my way to my room. If Calbix was awoken by me, he makes no move to come chastise me for being out without leave. I am too exhausted to care. After stripping down to my pants, I practically fall into the bed. I'm glad to be done with this day. It may have been rough and my resolve is still shaky, but I have no means of dealing with this feeling of inadequacy other than to try. And when I fail at that, I'll try more. My eyes close, unbidden, and I wiggle into a more comfortable position. I wonder what would mom say seeing me struggle. I miss her. The memory of her laugh is the last thing that I think of as sleep takes me fully. Uh, my back hurts. So. That was Infinite Space. Uh, could that be chapter two or chapter one? I forget. So, yeah. Um, I did not expect to see so much nudity. <laughs> Maybe at a not safe for work toggle in the future, please. Uh, but yeah, so... I feel like this is like the start of many stories where the main character feels woefully inadequate and is pretty much being very self-important right now where they're just thinking about themselves and not really about what other people are thinking and like clearly seeing that Kelvix is trying to cheer them up and just sort of trying to tell them that things will be okay but he's seeing it as like oh no I'm a failure I'm a failure my my knight doesn't care about me. He doesn't want to use me as cannon fodder for some weird reason, which sounds really, really weird. It kind of sounds like the Lupines got where they are in like the fight with this plague thing by literally using other species as, you know, basically cannon fodder, which is very suspicious, very sussy of them. Um, It's still lingering in my head that perhaps Calvix's uh, previous squire died in whatever it is that they were doing, either dying by taking the blunt of the hit for Calvix, or literally just died because, you know, they crashed or something. I don't know. Um, and Calvix took that really personally and probably realized that what they're doing is uh, probably not good. Um... So yeah, I'm assuming, I, I take it that the whole little, like, you know, jumping from the little chess piece to chess piece is the whole Agis system, where they share the pain. It would be interesting if um it went both ways, how it is, like, right here, where Calvix or the Knights don't just impart the pain that they're feeling from the fight 
uh, they also feel their squire's pain because you would think that that would be a bit more um, beneficial, like to for like the bonding and training exercises where it's not just you know the knight and you know the knight has this pain and then the squire feels the rest of it. Um, because again, that goes back to the whole thing of where the lupine are literally just using other species as cannon fodder. Or at least the knights of this group. So yeah. I also find it very funny that they call it finite space, because we all know space is infinite. Well, we know more or less that it kind of is infinite. Maybe it's like an ideological thing. Anyways, uh, so yeah, write down in the comments what you think. I'm not sure how long I had the other recording for when I had to stop. This will probably be a very long episode. So yeah. Again, write down in the comments what you thought so far, and thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play in Finite Space yourself or get up to date on what's going on with this story, um, there will be a link down in the description for the Twitter, which hopefully it hasn't imploded yet, um, which should have a direct link to the HIO page where you can download the game and, you know, play it yourself or just click follow and then, you know, it, it updates you when it updates. Or um, you can go on HIO yourself and then look for the game yourself in case you can't use Twitter or Twitter just, you know, stops working because of a certain little moron who runs the place now. But yeah, anyways, and um, if I believe they do have a Patreon, which I will post down in the description, which assuming again has early access to builds of infinite space, etc, etc, etc. And yeah, so I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.